Let's try that now. I think that was off. Test test one two three. Just gonna go unmute here for a second. Okay, let me see that. Yeah. I'm getting a little buzz. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I see the buzz. I think I'm just going to go back to my webcam. Oh, yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I still have never figured out how to do the audio with this. sec. Test, test, test. Oh my god. Hey. Yeah. There we go. Woo! Audio! Okay. Man. Getting the audio set up in OBS Studio is a real pain in the butt. So, Anyway, hello everyone. Welcome to, what is this, live stream eight? Um, yeah, so I did something a little bit different. Um, gathered some questions from everyone, put them into a Google Doc, and I'm gonna be going through the questions. But before we get started, let's have a little round of applause for my wife, Kim, for helping out with everything and doing the amazing thumbnails uh, because they are really cool. So thank you, Kim. Kim is on the other side, directly in front of me, um, answering your chat questions and everything. So yeah, um, for anyone answering questions or asking questions in the chat, I'm going to be maybe answering those later. Um, but for first things, I'm going to get straight to the questions that everyone asked in the form. So let's just go... Um, let me start with the Reddit questions. Um, a couple of people asked some questions on Reddit. So uh, I'm gonna start with this one from Tarotopor. I'm not sure how to say that. Do you think there is ever going to be proper payment for making BattleBots appearances just like normal reality shows, NASCAR sports, things like that? Uh, winning the giant nut, only net about 25,000, which is break even, blah, blah, blah. Do you think it's weird <clears> that do you think it's a real weird that BattleBots prize money always a secret secret and not mentioned on the show? 
So um, I'll address that first one. There is no um, super double secret prize money. Um, everything is pretty public. It's not like if you win BattleBots, they slip you a million dollars. It doesn't really work like that. Um, there is minimal prize money to be had with BattleBots. So most people are really not making, well, pretty much no one is actually making any money from this. Do I think that this is going to step up into a real sport? Maybe. Um, I think it's going to change drastically. I think, you know, companies like Intel, um, Microsoft, and things like that could get into it and they would probably make their own bots with their own engineering resources and maybe that's the way it will hit full time. But, you know, that's kind of the double edged sword because if it goes that way, it might not be really fun for, you know, people like me or you. Um, it might be just kind of corporate and it might be a lot like NASCAR. Right now, it's just kind of. Uh, very professional amateur, so it'd be nice if it stayed like that. I think the way that BattleBots is going to continue is through sponsors. Um, and I think this is a very perfect time to point out my sponsors. Um, you know, Tormach has always been a sponsor of mine. Um, haven't done a lot with them lately. Um, Avid CNC has been a fantastic sponsor for this next season of Copperhead and Rocky Mountain Water Jet, of course, and um, E-Gage Systems and TriPoint. Um, those have been sponsors and they have helped us kind of continue this. So I think as long as it stays in this kind of amateur area, um, I think the sponsors are going to be the ones that makes this happen and the prize money is just kind of irrelevant. So um, next question. Yes, Kim. Um, can you share the um, Google Doc so people can see the questions you're answering? Yeah. The yeah. link in the description is just the survey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good question. So let me do this. Copy link. Boom, boom. And let me see if I can edit the... See if I can edit the description. Yes, I can. So it'll be in the description. Um, here are the questions. It's not formatted very pretty, just so you know. Um, it's kind of uggers, but it's in there. Cool. So text strike through. I'll shift it. Um, Brinstead asked, this is a cool question. I like this one. Uh, what sorts of tools and spares do you bring to a competition? Wow, two people are already in there. Uh, what sort of tools and spares do you bring to a competition? This is a good question. For tools, Think about it this way. Am I gonna bring my mill? Am I gonna bring my lathe? No, you don't really need to bring those tools. The tools that you need to bring are the ones necessary to fix the robot. I never use hot glue in any of my robots. I never use duct tape, but duct tape and hot glue are like the first things that I bring. Glues, tapes, um, punches for like um, tapping out bearings that are you know all jacked up. Those are kind of the things that you need to bring. What you need to think about when you pack for a robot competition is the things needed to repair the robot, not make it. Um, I see a lot of people with, you know, making tools, but you really need to think more about what it's going to take to repair everything. So it's going to be dependent on your bot. Um, a Dremel is going to be indispensable. An Arbor Press, if there isn't one already at the competition. Tapes, glues, things like that. You need things that you can use to service the bot. Um, beyond that, I kind of notoriously don't bring a lot of uh, tools uh, because most of my bots are made with like one or two fastener types. So just a set of Allen keys, a set of screwdrivers, um, a drill, just a whole set of drill bits is good just for making some speed holes, <clears throat> David Small. Um, but yeah, tapes and glues, things like that. The other thing that I've learned over the years that you can't neglect is shop towels, band-aids, paper towels, things like that. Um, definitely bring a rag, bring some paper towels, and bring some band-aids because the bot is going to get very uh, messed up and very sharp and you're going to cut yourself. So those are the types of things you need to think about um, when bringing tools to a competition is the stuff you need to fix it. Um, Spares. Spares really depends on your design. For my stuff, if you've been following my um, channel for any length of time, you notice that my frames are almost always disposable. Um, Crippling Depression is a great example. I go through an entire frame every competition, 
and that's basically tossed out and then new competition I use a new frame. So it really depends on your butt. I rarely, if ever, break electronics. Um, I think Psychotic Break has never broken any electronics. Um, same with, I think Anxiety Attack even um, didn't have any electronics. I typically protect my electronics very well and the frame and everything else is what suffers. What are you looking for? Okay, Kim's looking for something. So yeah, that's um, the answer to that question. Control Shift 5, yes. Um, I'm gonna go back up to the top, so since everyone's following along, let's start with Sam. Sam says, how to use brushless motors with Bainbot's P61 and how to select a weapon motor for vertical spinner. So there's two kind of questions there. Um, Sam, if you look on my channel, um, I do have the drive section to crippling depression. From my understanding, the Bainbot's P60 is not very different than the P61. There's just a couple slight changes. They're largely the same. So look at crippling depression, drive. I forgot what part it is, but just search for that on my channel. And that will give you a really good idea of what it takes to mate a brushless motor to the P60 or the P61 gearboxes. How to select a weapon motor for vertical spinner. This is a very, this is a two hour answer right here. Um, basically what I would say is go to Ask Aaron, um, just Google that, go to Ask Aaron and look for their weapon calculators. You're gonna need to determine the MOI of your weapon, how much weight you're spinning, how fast you want it to spin. None of those things I can answer for you. You're gonna have to figure that out. Take a look at the Combat Robot tutorial guide from Riobots. Um, I have this linked in my Getting Started guide. You're going to need to figure out what your tip speed is, how much weight you're slinging, what your battery types are. Those are all the decisions that you make first before you do the motor. And I answer this question every single live stream. Figuring out what you're trying to accomplish first, then just plug in all those things into the motor. You're going to need, you're going to know what speed the motor is going to need to run at. You know what your voltage is, that's going to dictate your KV range. Then you're going to need to know how much torque you need, that's going to dictate the motor. The motor specs will dictate themselves to you once you figure everything else out. Louise, um, will you do a series about building combat robots for very cheap using simple tools? That would be awesome. I have been meaning to do this for pff, how many years, Kim? Like three years? Um, I've been wanting to do this video for a really long time. I just kind of haven't had the time. I'm always busy with other projects. I want to, um, I would definitely look at um, Team Panic, um, Ben's website or YouTube channel. Look for um, Team Panic on YouTube. He definitely does a lot more kind of like low budget stuff. Um, check out his stuff for that. One of these days I might end up doing it, but it's just not as much fun when you have all these cool tools. And I always like using all my tools. So um, maybe someday it's a really good idea. I've had it before, but yeah, just not, not, not yet. Um, anonymous, is it worth swapping out from a bar to a disc when in a horizontal versus vertical fight? This is an interesting question. Um, I actually do have a disc for Psychotic Break version 2, and the disc was specifically for those instances. To answer this question kind of simply, if you have a bar, it's probably going to get stopped a lot easier. Someone's going to be able to push you into a wall, and then you can stop it. However, with a disc, if you've watched you know, Crippling Depression, it's nearly impossible to stop that disc from spinning because of the way the engagement works. You know, you can pretty much push it against the wall, and as soon as it starts spinning even the slightest bit, it's going to get up to speed, and it's going to be very hard to stop. So it really comes down to what your kind of design philosophies are, um, how robust your weapon system is, how much of a vertical hit you can take. It really kind of comes down to it. If you do have a disc and a bar, and let's say the disc is has a small tooth, is the opponent going to be able to push you against the wall and stop it? Then you might want to go for the disc. Um, I think it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Ryan Collins, in your opinion, what are real possible real world application and what is learned from making competitive battle bots? Fantastic question. Um, I like this because it's one of the reasons why I do BattleBots is because you get the ability to do all these fun things. If I'm making 
I don't know, let's just say something stupid like fidget spinners. Who cares? You, you put a bearing in it, you spin it. What? What was that? You put a bearing in, you put a fidget, you just make a fidget spinner. It's really not that complicated. There's no real end goal to it. You just make it and it's done. With something like combat robots, there's always a challenge because other than bite force, there is not a combat robot that is just invincible. You can bring something to a competition and it can get wrecked in two minutes and then you go back to the drawing board. So, you know, in terms of real world application, you learn a lot about the right way to do something. And I have been doing projects for many years and BattleBots has really taught me the right way to use bearings, um, when bushings are applicable, um, sizing motors, how to learn different motor types. You, you learn how to do all these things and you learn how to do it wrong and then you learn how to do it right. Um, you get to mess with a lot of cool materials. I've got carbon fiber down there, I've got UHMW. I normally wouldn't have been exposed to these things because there's just no real reason for them until you have the purpose for them. So playing with carbon fiber was really cool. Playing with UHMW, playing with all these neat materials, figuring out the properties of titanium. Um, you just don't really get those opportunities um, in normal real world making. I see a lot of people doing, um, you know, like tables and um, furniture. And you know, there's really no wrong way to do that. You know, you kind of put it together and it looks good and that's that. But you're not like smashing it with a sledgehammer and oh, I should have made that frame stronger. So I think that's what's cool about combat robots is you learn how to do things the right way because you're putting these things through so much torture. <clears throat> um, ben, what do you enjoy most about combat robots? Designing, building, or fighting? Um, I think, I think designing is definitely number one, no question. Designing is the fun part. Um, with every new design, I go into it and the possibilities are endless. You know, when you do something like um, Lolo Man, the coolest part about that design is in the idea phase, is in when you're like, okay, I'm gonna make it this small and I'm gonna use this motors and you know, you just have all the ideas. Once you start getting into making it, all the realities set in like, ew, I can't actually do this. I can't actually do it that way. And machining this is gonna be hard. So it kind of starts out here in the design and then it always plummets and goes downhill. And then there's a nice little bump when you fight. So I would say designing is probably number one, fighting is number two and building is number three. But fighting is, kind of a double-edged sword because even though it's really cool you still are destroying the thing that you spent all this time doing and if it really does get destroyed it's kind of sad um, so yeah starts out goes down and it gets a little bit of a bump when you start fighting it um, I'm gonna yeah Kim. we're getting some really good questions in the chat here Ooh. so we might want to take a break to answer some of these cool yeah um, so kind of going in the order um, first of all, do you have any copperhead wheels you can easily bounce right now? That was requested by Hanish. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all want wheels? Um, actually, let me grab... This one's got a sprocket on it, so if it lands, funny. This one does not have a sprocket, so let me... See how this looks. Yeah, the shop's messy if you deal with it. Okay, so I want to be a little bit more. <laughs> Is that it? Did I do that right? No, nope, I did that wrong. <laughs> there we go. I have a CNC, everyone. So here is one of Copperhead's wheels. <laughs> See if we can get a good bounce out of it. Woo! So yeah, these things are. Quite heavy. I'll bounce a drum if you want. Oh, <laughs> okay, what else we got? All right, so um, Apex Leo asked about a good weight class for beginners. I said ant weight and beetle weight is good for kind of a cost and durability standpoint if you want to go into it anymore. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, beginners, I always recommend anything insect class. Ant and beetle weights are fantastic. Be a little bit careful with beetle weights because there are a few of us that have some really nasty designs and if you're going to go into the beetle weight, if you're going to go into beetle weight, build an ant weight, be overweight, and then just beef the hell out of it and make it really strong. Um, if you're going to be a beginner about it, um, it's just there's the beetle weights can be really devastating and really nasty. So if you build something and it's maybe a little bit lightweight or not very tanky, it might just get destroyed. So start out with an ant weight, and if you find yourself having an issue staying underweight, just kind of transition that design into a beetle. That's how a lot of beetles are actually born. <laughs> Um, let's see, uh, Kuko, what? No, I my mic. <laughs> oh, okay. Kuko asks, is asking about, um, legged robots and oh. that, uh, weight bonus and mm -hmm. if heavy weapons are used for that. And I thought maybe talking about Chomp. Heavy weapons? Like, uh, being able to use a weight bonus for mm. walking bots if, if people tend to use that for heavy weapons or destructive bots. Gotcha. Yeah, walking, I don't know that much about walking robots. I've never done one, and I haven't really seen that many. The problem with a walking bot is if you have a wheel, you have a wheel and a motor, and that's, you know, your set weight budget. If you start doing a walking mechanism, it's typically going to be significantly heavier. And generally speaking, about 20% of your weight can go to drive. I mean, you know, you can do whatever you want, but... Let's say 15 to 20 percent of your weight goes to drive so in a hundred pound robot that's you know 20 pounds let's say if you get a 50 percent weight bonus that drive might actually go up to double that so now you're at 40 pounds so you've used a portion of that extra weight for the extra amount needed for drive so a lot of people think oh you know the extra weight bonus i can just do a walker bot and then now have a 200 pound weapon well not really, because a lot of that weight is going to go into the drive, which is now going to be a lot more fragile. So it is a bit of a trade-off. You have to think about it. The good thing, though, is that when you get that weight bonus, the um, kinetic energy that the other guy is imparting into you now gets put into a much heavier bot. So in like the three-pound class, you know, I'm looking at like rickety cricket or something like that. When you hit against him, you're now hitting against a much heavier robot, so your hits don't do as much because the thing is just so much beefier and tankier. So, yeah, there's always a trade-off. Cool, cool. Um, so, Weewo1, which is <laughs> really <laughs> weird, Weewo, um, <laughs> was asking um, about choosing a weapon for... A heavier weapon that may be less powerful motor or a lighter weapon where you can have a faster mm. more powerful motor on that and how you make that calculation i i would said that was probably a question about um energy um, yeah. and that whole transfer of energy and how you go about calculating and deciding yeah, yeah. that yeah so th this is a this is a tricky question and it gets into a lot of very large topics um tip speed you can, okay, let's back up a little bit. Weapons in combat robots are simply storing, I guess generating, generating, storing, and transferring kinetic energy. So you generate it by spinning the thing up, you store it by having it in some mass that is spinning, and then you transfer it by hitting against something, slowing that down, and then transferring that energy into the other thing that you're hitting. So those three steps that you have. If we go back from the third step and go forward, transfer of energy. If you're spinning at 50,000 RPM, you're never going to transfer any of that energy. If you're spinning at like five RPM, you're gonna transfer pretty much all of that energy. However, the trade-off is the faster you spin, the more energy you're going to store. So there's a nice kind of fine line between 150, I think between 100 and 200 miles per hour tip speed is where you store the maximum amount of energy and you get the most amount of engagement. Um, so if you look at um, 
um, Isaac Mailer's um, robots, um, what's Red Dye number five, it's a relatively slow tip speed and it always gets really good engagement. It doesn't necessarily always explode bots, but it always gets a good engagement because of the low tip speed. But then you look at some really fast weapons, you basically have to drive really fast into the other robot to get that engagement. But when you do get that engagement, all of that kinetic energy goes into it and it just bark, explodes everywhere. So you kind of have to ride that balance. If you're going to go really fast, you need to pay a lot of attention to the actual engagement and make sure that you can transfer that energy in. If you're going to go very slow, you're either going to have low kinetic energy or you need a large mass to make up for that so that you have more kinetic energy going in. Whew, physics. <laughs> um, we have a friend from Brazil who is asking if we would ever consider going to a competition in Brazil. Oh, maybe, maybe. Um, you guys know how to do combat robots, so props to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shout out to Brazil. I would maybe consider it. Um, I, I guess in the next you know, couple of years, there's probably going to be very few competitions, if any. Um, but yeah, I would consider it. Um, what weight classes do you guys do down there? I know you do like lightweights. I actually don't know much about your competitions down there, but yeah, I'd, I'd entertain it. Um, Jonathan Clayton um, had a question about replacement strategy. So how um, do you decide when to replace something? Do you just go on um, if it fails or do you replace it if it looks worn or a number of battles, stuff like that? Okay. Um, someone else asked a similar question, so I'm going to answer both kind of together here. Um, Team Torg um, asked, what spare components do you use the most during a competition, and what do you think the most important spare to have if you have something that doesn't what bring to any essential spares or spares of everything? Wow. Whew, that's a lot. Um, everyone's going to be different, and everyone's robot is going to be different. For me personally, I kind of talked a little bit about this previously, I protect my electronics. I use very low-end electronics. Like, I don't think I've ever gone anything beyond Hobby King um, other than Copperhead, but that's not my design. Um, Crippling Depression uses all Hobby King stuff. All my stuff uses Hobby King, Amazon, or eBay electronics. Because of that, I make sure that the electronics are over spec and... Um, very, very well protected. I also try my best to protect the drive. So it depends on your design strategy. Because of that, I tend to not have very many spares for motors, and I tend to have not many spares for electronics. I typically only have one full set of spares for the electronics and the motors. I have not really used those in any of the past competitions. Some people will have a weapon motor for every single fight that they're going to be fighting because they're just, you know, going to blow out that weapon motor. It really depends on what your design is. Um, if you do a hub motor and you protect the hell out of it and it's really robust and really overbuilt, you might only need two for a whole competition. Um, if you do a solid billet body, maybe you only need one of those. It really depends on your design. What I would put most of my effort into is drive. Make sure you always have enough spares for drive because that's the most important thing. If you have a working weapon and no working drive, you can't compete. So make sure that you always have enough for at least your drive and then go from there. So hopefully that answers the question. All right. Steven asks, is Bite Force really invincible? You gotta <laughs> take a fall sometime. <laughs> yeah, Steven, Bite Force invincibility. I think it might be. Um, Paul and I have talked a few times, and I don't know if he's really doing anything special. Um, Bite Force is not, no offense, Paul, really sorry, but your bot is not anything special. It's it's an aluminum four-wheel drive vertical spinner with some wedgelets. I mean, come on, you know, I mean, that's like, it's really not that outside the box. Um, it's brushed. It's not even like crazy brushless blah, blah, blah. There's really nothing that's special about Bite Force. What's special about Bite Force is Paul and his team. You guys have all watched BattleBots, and you've seen on BattleBots 
how very little damage bite force takes. It would maybe surprise you to know that when we roll in at around 10 a.m., they're already there. When we leave at 10 p.m., they're still there. They're constantly working on the bot. If one thing fails, they fix it and they make sure that that thing never fails again. That's the special thing about bite force is their attention to detail. So I think this kind of speaks greater to um, combat robots in general. Everyone has these crazy ideas like, oh, I'm going to do a flipper and I'm going to do this and I'm going to put this in there and no one's ever used magnesium and, you know, oh, I'm going to do the special alloy. It's not about that. It's about the details. It's about making sure everything fits together the right way and making sure that your motors are specced properly and they're held in place the right way and you have the right screws and the screw length is right and you have the right engagement. It's all those little details that make up the bot. The big picture is really not that important. It's the details that make it up. Copperhead is a fantastic robot. It's a very well-built and well-designed robot, but it comes down to the details, the little things like not lock tightening some of the wheels before a competition. Um, you know, there is an error on the temperature sensor. You know, all those little details are what makes the bot good. So Bite Force itself is a rather generic robot, but the attention to detail is what makes it invincible. Mm -hmm. Damn straight. Um, Daniel asks, um, what about using a DC motor for a weapon? DC? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Daniel says, what about using a DC motor for a weapon? Well, they're all DC. All the motors are DC. We don't use AC here. So. I don't know any better. Need some clarification on that. Um, Matt, let's see. Um, Matt asks, how do you decide what effective weapon diameter you want, assuming constant MOI and weight? Oh, assuming constant MOI and weight, the diameter. Okay, um, that's a good question. Um, I would kindly refer you to look at the RioBots Combat Robot Guide. <laughs> um, it comes down to tip speed once again. Tip speed is king. Um, if you, let's say you have an MOI of five, who cares, five, um, and your drum is going to be, you know, that big around, let's just assume it's going to be a drum and it's like that, is your tip speed going to be, you know, 500 miles an hour? If it's going to be 500 miles an hour, maybe you need to increase that diameter. Um, if you already have a fixed MOI, let's say a fixed motor, all of that good stuff, just make sure that your tip speed is in a reasonable range. Like, any more, I try and go in that 150 to 200 absolute tops range, um, and that's just kind of where I try and end up. Um, don't try and get a gold star for having the fastest tip speed at a competition. It won't get you anywhere. Um, people are saying that we probably meant brush versus brushless, and I'm saying that's mm -hmm. usually a question of your expertise level. Um, yeah. That brushed, um, oh, wait, brushless always gives you more bang for your weight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kim is 100% right. I, I get all my information directly from her. Um, <laughs> brushed versus brushless. Very simply, I think I've answered this in most live streams, mm -hmm. brushless is going to be lighter, more powerful, given the same amount of weight. It might even end up being cheaper. So, wow, the whole trifecta, it's cheaper, it's lighter, and it's more powerful. Whoa! However, it comes at the downside of being very finicky and difficult to implement. There you go. Um, you sacrifice, you get all those things over here, but then you sacrifice reliability and ease of use. So, trade-off. Um, Fatox? Fatox the Great? Fatox. The Fatox. Great. Oh, the Great? The Great Fatox. Oh. As, um, how fast is too fast for the BattleBot? So that's like a maximum tip oh. speed for BattleBots yep. specifically. BattleBots has a tip speed limit of 250 miles an hour. Um, at 250 miles an hour, you're generally not going to get good tip engagement. But if you did, um, with some of the weapons that happen on BattleBots, if you did get full engagement, it would send a part flying faster and with more kinetic energy than they are comfortable with the Lexan handling. So for BattleBots, there is a tip speed limit. Um, Motorama has a tip speed limit of about 200 miles an hour, I think. So anywhere beyond that, just don't design for it. It's too fast. 
Um, he said he meant drive speed limit. Oh, yeah, drive speed? There's, there's no way. drive speed limit um, for BattleBots. Um, I highly encourage everyone to look at my magnets video, how to use magnets or something like that. <laughs> Prop. So you got this wheel, right? You got this wheel. It's doing this kind of thing. It's moving your bot. Well, let's say I just have thousands and thousands of amps worth of power to put into this thing. At a certain point, it's just gonna spin. That is the amount of torque that is going to take to get this to break traction. The way you can calculate this, and you can just calculate this, is the coefficient of friction, you know, how sticky this is to the surface that you're using it on. So that's one factor. Then how much downforce and how much weight is being applied to this, that is going to dictate basically how much speed you can get out of this. What you're gonna find is that even at the heavyweight level, I can bring Copperhead out into my driveway um, or out into the street, which is asphalt, and I can just spin the wheels at a standstill. That means that I don't have enough downforce or I don't have enough coefficient of friction to transfer that rotational energy into forward momentum. If we to add 500 extra pounds to this and really press it down, then we could translate that. But one of the problems that you have is if you want to go like really fast, you need a way to transmit that energy into the ground or whatever it is. And what you find is a lot of people are running with a severe excess of drive power, and that's why you see them kind of drifting and sliding around. It's really the ability for the wheel to get traction and actually push the robot forward. So there is no real drive um, limits or restrictions. It's, it's physics. Physics is limiting you. And we have kind of a dual question. Um, Ruddy Duck asks um, about day jobs and crack. Tobia um, asked to hear our story. Oh. Like life story kind of thing. Life story, wow. I know, um, that's a big question. That's a very big question. Um, what was the first first one? Was, day job. Oh, day job. Yes, yeah, so this is in the FAQ, um, but I am the vice president of eGage Systems, which is a company that makes um, hardware energy monitoring solutions. Um, basically, we make a box I might have one somewhere, but me. <laughs> um, Egage.net um, is where you can find more information. It is a box about, you know, yay big, and um, it is a internet connected device that reads information from CTs, current transformers, and gives you um, that into a graph, basically. So it's an, it's an energy monitoring device and platform. And um, so, yeah, I am the vice president of that company. I started as the product manager five, almost five years ago now. No, four years ago. I don't remember. Yeah, four years ago, something like that. Um, started out as the product manager. Um, I was actually hired because one of the engineers um, knew of me through SparkFun and um, worked my way up. And um, I think within the last uh, year, I took over the um, VP role. So yeah, um, kind of do product development, supply chain, all that good stuff. Um, I, I want clarification on the Our Life story because I don't want to go too deep into that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, clarification, clarify what you want. I'm going to switch to a couple more of the- Yeah, that's a good, good call. Yep. So I'm going to switch to that, get some clarification, and we'll come back. Um, Alex Howard has asked two questions. Um, first question is, I know you say combat robot games is a rock, paper, scissor. So what are the robots that Crippling Depression could beat and what designs could beat it? Well, this is simple. Crippling Depression can beat every robot out there and nothing can beat it. Done. <laughs> um, I think Crippling Depression, ah, it, it's a weird bot. What do you think, Kim? Um, what bots can beat Crippling Depression? Well, what bot has beat Crippling Depression? Um, Kitty Cat. Um, we had a hell of a <clears throat> go with um, Beam, our friend Beam. Yeah, I think Horizontal Spinners. Um, mm -hmm. I think a you know Tombstone Clone Horizontal Spinner is kind of the the worst case scenario because it is 
a square box and That's hitting bolted together yeah yeah really catching that edge mm -hmm. so i think the worst robot for us is going to be a horizontal spinner like the mid cutter thing um everything else it works relatively well with um it's durable enough to work in outlast wedges although you know we've kind of come close with wedges before but it does hit low enough on the ground to where it typically does catch a wedge um, I don't think flippers would be much of an issue because of that same reason. Um, basically, the low-slung weapon is really nasty with anything that relies on wedgelets or wedge, a flipping arm thing like that. Um, overhead bots really aren't that big of an issue because we just flip it upside down. We've had good luck with that. So yeah, I'd say horizontal mid-cutters are the worst, and everything else it kind of does well with i think the best bot for it to face is probably an overhead honestly um, because we just flip it upside down and then that overhead is just completely useless um, alex also asks what is your recommendation for overthrowing the vertical spinner meta competitions i attend uh, top five teams from the past three years have been vertical spinners yeah vertical spinners are tough um, because because of many reasons I think the best way to get around a vertical spinner is going to be a wedge, unfortunately. Um, a wedge or a very high um, riding horizontal spinner. A lot of these guys are just using these two little uprights and they're just using bushings or something like that. The um, lateral strength of those uprights really isn't that great. Um, I. I want to try psychotic break against some of these uh, verticals because I feel like if I hit up high enough, I could just tweak those upright rails and then it would be all over. So, you know, horizontal and verticals are always the two um, enemies. What's that's that phrase? What? Horizontal, mortal enemies. Horizontals yeah. and verticals are always yeah. kind of mortal enemies. So yeah, I think I think a um, good. Um, stout horizontal would be the way to go. Isaac Mailers had a question on this list. Um, I'm going to do two more and then we can come back. Um, Isaac Mailers, why have you switched away from UHMW and your designs after having good success with it in Sergeant Cuddles? Interesting question. Um, UHMW is very heavy. Um, with Sergeant Cuddles, the weapon was reasonable, the frame was pretty much indestructible, but that left almost nothing for drive. I was using little N20s with foam wheels or the Pololu wheels because I just had nothing, absolutely nothing left over for weight. So one of the reasons I went away from UHMW to the more 3D printed designs and stuff like that is because UHMW is just very heavy. Uh, when you look at 3D printed nylon, carbon fiber, whatever, UHMW and aluminum, it really is almost, um, I'd have to look this up, but you know, you have aluminum and then you have UHMW and the spacing between the density of those is almost equal. So you're definitely adding a lot of weight in UHMW. It's easy to machine, but it's difficult to get complex shapes out of it because once you start going really thin, it starts moving on you and it's hard to kind of clamp down. So machining it can be a little bit tricky. Um, but now that you say that, eh, maybe I want to go back to using some more UHMW. However, you say that, but the drive pods, which I think are one of the most successful things about crippling depression, are UHMW solid bodies. So I still kind of, I haven't really fully gotten rid of it. Um, one more. Kuro Fox. K-U-R-O Fox? Kuro Fox? Um, is it possible to make a complete heavyweight Lolo Man for battle bots? How practical will it be? We have talked about this. You remember me talking to you about this, Kim. Um, Lolo Man heavyweight. I, that would be hilarious. I have, I have thought about this. I might have even started a couple files in SolidWorks. I've definitely given Lolo Man some thought. Um, the best I could come up with was P60 gearboxes. So basically the drivetrain of crippling depression in a solid body frame. And I do have my Avid CNC router. So I've done the math and I think like a four foot by four foot billet and maybe about three inches tall would be Lolo Man at the heavyweight. 
it would need a weapon, so I would have to do some kind of like um, biohazard style lifting arm, maybe like a lucky kind of thing. I have thought about it. Um, I think it would be, I don't know, it would be very interesting. You, I think it would turn out to be a lot like duck. It would just be kind of a slim down, squashed out duck. It would be complicated because it probably need to be like eight wheel drive or something like that. It, I've thought about it. I've thought about it, but I haven't really gotten there yet. Um, but if I ever get there and think that it could actually be possible, eh, maybe I'll do it. So what do you got, Kim? All right. Let's see. Um, let me go back here. Neuron was asking um, about upgrading a brush motor versus going brushless. Oh. Um, I, I don't fully understand personally. Yeah. Um, using a more powerful brush, but I, I would think that just adds to your weight. Like, yeah. If you want to talk about that. Yeah, brushed motors are generally very heavy. Um, let's just say by a factor of like anywhere from two to four times as heavy, depending on what weight classes you go for. If you're wanting more power than what your brushed motor can do, it might be a good time to look at brushless. If anyone's talking about anything in the lower weight classes, like insect classes, go brushless. If you're talking about heavy weights, it's more complicated than that. But in the insect class, quite frankly, I am not sure why anyone is using brushed motors. I'll just go out and say it. Mm -hmm. um, I, what was it? Psychotic Break got second place. And actually, both if I factor in both psychotic breaks, um, version one and version two, version one, version one did two full competitions and got like third and fourth place, and version two got second place. All of those fights, I used the same ESCs, the same motors, and the same gearboxes. Um, I take that back. I did lose the ends of the shafts, but the actual gearboxes was fine. So. I don't know, they're durable, they're reliable, and they're significantly less weight than the counterparts. And if you watch my, I think it's like five videos back, I was showing the amount of torque that you can get out of the BL Heli, um, where I put the robot down, add a couple pounds of downforce and push. I think they're every bit as powerful as a brushed version. So in the insect classes, don't use brushed, my opinion. Um, Fat Ox asked about angled horizontals, um, like Texas oh. Twister, and so we're kind of having some discussion in the chats about having a weird gyroscopic effect whenever you yeah. impact, and that's what we've seen. You kind of destabilize and... Yeah. Um, fun fact, Sergeant Cuddles, the very first version of Sergeant oh, Cuddles, yeah. you remember I, this, that, that was, so long ago. was kind of a triangle wedge-shaped um, version of Sergeant Cuddles, but it was two wheel drive in the back and it had an angle bar in the front. And I swear this is like, oh, what if you just attach a gun to it? This is the thought that everyone has. What if you just took a weapon and angled it in the front? It just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. The gyroscopic forces are super weird. I actually finished the bot. <clears throat> I, I wish I would have kept it, but I had a fully complete Sergeant Cuddles with a weapon in the front and two weeks before we were going to leave for the competition <laughs> i threw it away because it was garbage they just don't work as soon as you get tweaked or hit it's just going to fly up and then you're just going to land upside down and you're done like texas twister did it a little bit different but it's just there's so many reasons why it's not going to work out well and physics is the number one of those reasons uh, Steven asks, how do you think a tombstone versus a sow fight would have turned out? I said a splode. <laughs> yeah, tombstone versus sow would have been fantastic. Um, having the um, sow arm in my office right inside, I can say that tombstone would have won um, because you can see all of these hairline cracks and all these fractures all along the arm in sow. The arms are really strong for what they are, but them going head to head against Tombstone, I think Tombstone would would definitely win. I mean, how many times have you seen Tombstone lock up the weapon? Never. 
the chain has fallen off, mm -hmm. the batteries have failed, the motors failed, but the weapon is always spinning freely. Like that thing is always just flopping in the wind. So I don't think it, it's a strong enough structure that I don't think um, Sal would stand a chance. I mean, stand a chance. I think if it was a weapon to weapon hit, Tombstone would always win that. Yeah. Be fun. Jay asks about, for weapons, hub motor versus belt drive. Oh, hub motor all the way. I hate belts. <laughs> um, I think, you know, watch my hub motor video. I kind of go over a lot of this stuff. I think generally speaking, you know, plenty of people have good luck with belts. However, people that have used belts, I think you can, I don't think anyone that's used belts can tell me they've never had an issue with a belt ever. Um, belts still break and, okay, I guess crippling depression has a belt, mm -hmm. um, but it's fully protected. It's in a channel and there's no way for that belt to really go anywhere. Um, but I have had belt issues twice. Belts are complicated. Like in combat robots, if you cannot add any additional components, that's generally a good idea. Um, so I would say if you can do a hub motor, do a hub motor. But it's heavier, it's more complicated, it's going to be more expensive, and unless you do it right, it could be less durable. But if you do it right and you have the weight for it, I do think it outweighs using a belt all day long. Uh, Spectre FPV asks, I'll have to read this because I don't know these details. Any thoughts on utilizing an AIO flight controller ESC Tiny Lord for an ant weight mm. bot? Newer versions are rated 20, 30 amps per channel. Yeah, I, I'm not that familiar with those, but I think you're kind of talking like those are like a BL Heli type thing. Um, I think that would be totally fine. Um, I've seen a lot of people use um, the kind of all-in-one quad boards to where it's like four ESCs all-in-one and they're meant for quadcopters. Yeah, totally fine. Um, you're not going to get the actual current ratings out of those. It's going to be a lot less than that. Um, but yeah, I don't see any issue with that. Um, I'm using the... Uh, for Psychotic Break, my three-pounder, the weapon and the drive are basically those types of things. They're specifically made for those types of things. So, yeah, I, I don't see any issue with that. Uh, saddle Piggy. Saddle Piggy. <laughs> um, I doubt you've used them, but do you have any opinions or buyer bewares on cheap Chinese electronics like ESCs? I've used them in my RC planes and they were fine, but I don't know if it would translate. Who was that? Saddle Piggy? Saddle Piggy. Um, Saddle Piggy. That's all I ever use. All of the stuff in all of my robots is just cheap Hobby King crap, um, other than Copperhead. Um, and Copperhead really isn't that much different. But yeah, all the stuff I use is just really cheap. Like, I don't think I've ever spent more than $40 on an ESC for any of my own robots. Um, you know, you can go back in all my videos, but the weapon... ESC and crippling depression is just a red brick, which is just a really, you know, bottom of the barrel kind of thing. Um, the drive ESCs are the F80s or the F60s, which are just the generic Hobby King ESC. And then in all of my um, insect class stuff, it's all just BL Heli Multistar. Um, so yeah, all the things I use are Hobby King. And the thing to keep in mind is don't really trust the current ratings over spec it a little bit and protect it and then you should be fine make sure your drive doesn't bind up make sure your weapon doesn't bind up and make sure that your mechanicals are well done if you make sure that the mechanical side of things is good you're putting less strain on the motor and less strain on the esc and then those things will typically be okay let's see maroon monkey asks if you could give some insight on your experience with drum spinners like Copperhead. Mm. That's kind of generic. Yeah, I I don't know what experience to give. Um, drum spinners, they're not my favorite design. Gyro. Oh, sucks. yeah. Gyro sucks. They're, yeah, they're not my favorite design. Um, gyroscopic, gyrocopic, <laughs> gyroscopic forces are a pain. You know, physics is physics. If you get the drum up to a level that's going to do some damage, you're going to want to go up on the edge. The other thing about a drum that is complicated is because it has a smaller effective diameter, your tip speed is generally going to be higher. 
if you want your MOI to be reasonable to get your kinetic energy high enough. Look at all those words. <laughs> Generally speaking, drums spin fast, make hard hit. But if you want make hard hit, need to drive fast. You need to drive fast enough so that you get that engagement to hit the other robot. So that's why you see drum spinners kind of doing these line drives trying to hit because it's all about engagement. If that tip speed is really high, you actually need to engage very quickly to get that tip speed to catch. You never see a slow drum. Like you never see a drum spinning slowly because all the weight is concentrated more towards the inside. Sao, Son of Waiachi, is huge and it only spins, I think, at like 100 miles per hour because all the weight is so far outside. If you concentrate the weight in a very small area, you need to spin a lot faster to get that kinetic energy. So it's a difficult design to pull off right. Yeah, thoughts on drums. <laughs> um, <coughs> Saddle Piggy again um, is asking about softer ablative armor and we, I, I was going to say that aluminum is kind of yeah. softer ablative in higher weight class. Yeah, ablative armor. Every weight class has its own version of what ablative mm -hmm. armor is. In um, the one and the three pound classes, um, I think 3D printed could be 3D printed. Mm -hmm. 3D okay. printed um, can be an ablative, and that's kind of what I use on mine is it's sacrificial. I think in the one and the three pound class, you could kind of replace ablative with sacrificial. Um, what was it Isaac did the little like finger whiskers on the outside that was kind of ablative um, you start moving up into your uh, middle weight classes like 30 and 60 pounds and I think UHMW is pretty ablative at that level then you get up into the higher weight classes aluminum becomes ablative and then when you get into heavy weights I guess aluminum still is ablative but it really depends what the forces are involved Aluminum in your one and three pound class is like practically solid, but then when you get up to heavyweight, then it becomes ablative. I want to give a shout out to Zoomania, whose university team just qualified for national championship. Woo! That's awesome. Shout out. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Tamoji Daka. Um, any advantages, disadvantages using reversible vertical spinners? And I don't really know, yeah. like for invertibility purposes, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, So if you have a vertical spinner and you have an ESC and it's brushless, <clears throat> you can have the option to make that reversible. There's no real downside to that. You're basically just making, I'm going to explain this like I'm explaining it to you. You basically have the stick and the position of the stick is going to translate to whether it moves in one direction full range or if that stick movement is cut into two pieces one goes in one direction the other goes in the other direction it doesn't really change the power of the esc it just kind of remaps the signal so that your signal at zero goes one way and the other way goes reverse versus it just goes one way that's about it. You're going to lose some granularity in where that stick position is, and you're going to you know, need to change some other stuff. I don't really see it as a downside. I just don't think most people do it because, one, most ESCs are not bidirectional or not reversible, so you kind of have to do some reprogramming. It's just kind of some extra work. But in terms of a downside, man, there's no real downside to it. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say one thing. There is one downside is that you do need to wait for the weapon to fully stop, wait, and then reverse it. You can't really quickly cycle back between the two. So I guess that's kind of a, a slight downside. You need to pay attention. And in the heat of the moment in a fight, if you do something and you're like, oh, I'm upside down, and then you like reverse it, yeah, you could maybe run into some issues there. But. B-L-D-G-A-L-N, I'm not going to try and Oh, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. <laughs> um, have you ever tested any Tallman nylon alloys yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't actually done anything with the Tallmans. Um, I, Tallman 910 is apparently like the shizzle for doing um, insect class. I just haven't ever done it. Um, I don't know. I've been, I only fix what's broken. And... 
I've broken a lot of my nylon prints and I've had you know a lot of damage to them, but it's never really cost me a fight. I've never lost a fight because a 3D print of mine has failed. So I just kind of haven't looked at it yet. Um, 3D printing is a really annoying thing for me because it's fiddly and it, it takes a long time to like test different prints. So I just haven't ever switched to it. But yeah, I hear that that is the go-to filament. Jonathan Clayton asks for high RPM weapons. Is wind resistance noticeable? Yes. Would you be able to noticeably decrease the power needed to spin up or keep the weapon at full speed if you optimize for aerodynamics? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, I wish Isaac would do a video on this because he's actually done a lot more testing on this than me. But generally speaking, if you have... I'm only going to speak to insect classes because if you go up into the heavier weight classes, hitting 200 is just kind of silly. There's no point to it. But below 200 miles per hour for the um, insect classes, wind resistance is less of an issue. When you hit a threshold, I think Isaac was telling me around 150 miles an hour, anything beyond their wind resistance definitely becomes a factor. And you'll see a lot of people like, you know, oh, I'm doing like 300 miles per hour tip speed. No, you're not. You're yeah. not. Um, wind resistance is a huge factor. And even though it looks like you're drawing a ton of power, it's probably mostly wind resistance. Um, maybe you can throw a tack on there and find out that you are actually doing it, but you're just wasting a lot of energy doing that. Wind resistance does become a problem. Now, here's what becomes interesting is... Making your weapon more aerodynamic will probably, probably impact your uh, transfer of energy. So let's say it was like a propeller and you had that nice, like clean leading edge. Well, now you're going to be impacting with that leading edge. You could profile the rest of the weapon and do some other things, but generally speaking, you want a hard hitting surface so that you can transfer the maximum amount of kinetic energy. So it's like everything in combat robots, it's a trade off. Going faster gives you more stored kinetic energy. Going slower gives you less stored kinetic energy. The faster you go, the more wind resistance is gonna be an issue. The more aerodynamic you make it, the less of a hitting or impacting surface you're gonna have. Whack-a-mole. I am gonna transition into a couple yeah. of these and then we'll go back. Sure. Um, whew, wow. Do you need more tea? Oh, I think I'm good with my tea. Um, team Get Wrecked Robotics. Um, hello, Robert. Huge fan of your videos. Thank you. You're very efficient, blah, 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 platitudes. Um, how, have you thought about trying any other kinds of designs? Of course. Um, I've thought about pretty much every design out there. What I typically do is I constantly talk to my wife about different Ooh. designs and my various ideas. Whenever we go walk our dogs, I'm like, so, Kim, I want to do a flipper. No, seriously. Um, and I'll sit there and tell her all these ideas. And until I have an idea that just sticks in my head and I can't get it out of my head, that's kind of typically when I do it. So you might remember Lolo Man, Kim. I was talking about it for, what, like six months or something. Mm -hmm. And then finally I had the idea of doing like the little modular cartridges. And that was the moment where I'm like, okay, I'm doing it. Um, I've thought about a flipper many times, but I haven't thought of a way to do it drastically different than how it's already done. Um, you know, it's one of those things that I've, oh, I've thought about grabbers a lot, like, you know, some kind of thing. Unless I come up with kind of like a novel idea or an interesting way to do it, I typically won't do that. But yeah, I've, I've toyed around with a lot of these. Um, I want to do kind of an overhead hammer bot. But yeah, and just, until I have that aha moment, I typically don't do it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do, do, do. Um, let's do one, like three more. Blood sport. Mm -hmm. I know that no weapon is better than the other, but if I told you to build a robot, would you rather choose an egg beater or a drum? Um, this is a good question. And I did take a peek in the comments and I'm gonna say this once again, it depends on the weight class. If I'm doing a um let's say a 60 pound bot or under i would do an egg beater if i'm doing an over i would do a drum drums are going to be more durable 
Um, you're going to get less big hits out of them, but they're going to be more durable overall. What I've seen is that egg beaters tend to fail and break um, because the uh, structure just can't be as strong when you start moving up into the heavyweight classes. If you're doing an insect class, egg beater all the way. Um, I would probably never do a dr drum ever again in the insect classes because you really want that weight to be as far out on the outsides as possible. That's the benefit to an egg beater. And at the insect classes, you can very easily accomplish um, the right strength to weight ratio in the smaller class. So if small, egg beat, if big, drum. Uh, let's see a couple more. There we go. Max Steel with like three E's and two L's asks, what is your next beetle weight going to be? Um, I don't really have a next beetle weight. I'm pretty happy with Psychotic Break for right now. Um, my next beetle weight is going to either be, you heard it here first, a revisit of Long Long Man. Um, I do have a design in mind to make Long Long Man competitive. So Long Long Man will probably get a full redesign and be a new bot. I'll probably just surprise everyone with you know that next competition. It's either going to be that or it's going to be the revamp of Lolo Man. I have a couple of ideas on how I want to revamp Lolo Man. However, Lolo Man will only be at an event to where the floor is perfectly flat. What's up? Lolo or Long Long? Lolo. Lolo. Yeah. So Lolo and Long Long will both kind of be revamped. Um, depends on which one I get to first. It depends on the competition because if the floor is garbage, then it's going to be Long Long Man. Mm -hmm. Last one of these and take a break. Um, Jarvis, would you build a vertical spinner anytime soon? Maybe. I've really wanted to do just your good old classic vertical spinner. I kind of want to do like a... I don't want to say this in a reference design. Like I kind of just want to do it the right way. You know, wedgelets up front, magnets, low, you know, just kind of all the things that you're supposed to do. As I've said earlier in this live stream, it's really not about the big picture of the bot. It's about the little things that you do and how you design, how all of the little systems and all the pieces fit together is really the most important thing. So if I was going to do a four wheel drive, I'd probably, you know, um, isolate the drive in um, UHMW pods. I would have probably a completely separate weapon system. I wanted to do a weapon system out of UHMW for various reasons. So yeah, I might. Um, I just kind of really haven't gotten around to it. If I was going to do a vertical, it would be a three pound at the very, very least. But I'd maybe want to do like a 30 or something. I don't know. We'll see. All right. So what you got, Kim? I think I've only got like two more on the spreadsheet or on okay. the thing. <coughs> um, Fanbox was asking about um, what your thoughts would be for a 250-pound anything goes competition. <laughs> I said people going to die. 250-pound <laughs> anything goes? Yeah. Oh, man. What would you even do for that? Anything goes. Let me think. Let me think what that means, because anything kind of already goes. Like no tip speed limit, like... The thing about know, tip speed limit is you have to drive fast enough to get it. Like, you know, Deep Six was a one-hit wonder because, right. yeah, I, I wouldn't go tip speed. Um, I do Melty Brain. I do 250-pound Melty Brain. Uh, uh, yeah. Melty Brains are the translational drift. Basically, it's a bot that spins, the, the whole bot spins, and it pauses or breaks the motors at a set point. So basically, if the robot is doing this kind of thing and you want it to drive <laughs> it forward, it would pause or accelerate a little bit every time it gets around to that. And um, they're called melty brains for I don't know really what reason. But I would do a 250 pound melty brain. The reason why melty brains aren't in battle bots is because they don't have an active weapon. But really the only thing that you need to do with a melty brain is make the thing drive. The complexity of a melty brain is that reading that set point to where, oh, it's facing this way, it's facing that way, giving it that beacon or that, uh, I guess, reference indicator point is difficult at high speed. So you need it to be big 
so that you have a lower tip speed or a lower RPM speed, blah, blah, blah. So the bigger they get, the easier it is to make. So I would do that. Truth of asks, um, for cuddles, do you prefer the drum or the beat of our approach? Mm. Since you've done both. That's a good question. The drum or the beater for cuddles. Um, the drum actually performed better. Um, the drum performed better, but the beater bar was cooler. If I was going to redesign cuddles, which I might, um, if I was going to redesign cuddles, I'd probably go with something a little bit more beatery. Um, right now, from the side, it's just kind of a slim rectangle. I would probably angle it more so that I have more of a height and do a better beater bar. I, I'd probably go beater. The drum was cool, but it never really like knocked anyone out. It just kind of flipped people a lot, but it didn't do a ton of damage. So probably beater. Um, any connection to the FRC team? No. We don't, we don't really know, no. No, um, yeah. I've, I've never done FRC. Um, I really only became aware of it um, when I started doing combat robots. We didn't, we didn't have any of that back in Illinois. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was completely unaware that that even existed until pff, 10 years ago, something like that. It makes me sound old. <laughs> You're not old. I'm old. <laughs> um, Tamujit has a preference between drum or vertical in higher weight classes? Drum or vertical? Oh. Um, I love Copperhead. Um, I like vertical better. Um, I like I like the bar. Um, I think the problem with the drum is that... So if you have a drum... <laughs> Like this drum, for instance. If you have a drum, the issue with this is, look at the end, look at the bearing. That's the bearing that sits in it. Your frame is going to be taking up this much of it. So you're really only left with this little bit of the tooth sticking out, and you can't really just, you can never really stick out that much from the frame. You know, your frame is always going to be about here. So you really never get the opportunity to get that much tip engagement. Whereas with a vertical um, spinner, it can stick out a lot more and you can get more of that cut. But if you look at the um, damage, it might be hard to see in the video, we're really never hitting anything other than just this very tiny little lip. We never really hit anything here. It's always just on that very little lip on the edge. So my two cents. Was that a shaft? Sorry. Oh, that was a drum. That was a drum? Oh, okay. Drum. Um, uh, Fadox said, looks like you made a way beefier weapon shaft for Copperhead this time around. We didn't. I thought you did a different material though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the old weapon shaft of Copperhead was some steel. Um, I don't even know. It wasn't like 4140. It was just, it was a case hardened steel, which is basically like a Twinkie. You have a nice crunchy. <laughs> Twinkies aren't crunchy. You have a. <laughs> you have a I know, crunchy <laughs> Twinkie. You have like a little bit of a hardness on the outside, but the inside is effectively pretty squishy. Um, so the previous one was just um, case hardened. The new ones, I have them right here. Oh, those are magnets. Okay, maybe I don't have them. The new ones look like this. Just kidding. Um, the new ones are actually S7. Um, and S7 is the same material as the drum. The interesting thing that we did with the um, uh, new weapon shafts is they're not that hard. So S7, usually you harden it to be 56, 57 Rockwell. I want to say that the weapon shafts are like 52, so it's a lot softer, um, but S7 is pretty uh, pretty strong to begin with. So we went from a generic steel over to um, case hardened generic steel to hardened S7, but not super hard, so it's brittle. Um, let's see. Jay 
was asking what you prefer in an eight kilogram bottle, which is like 17, yeah, 16, 17 pounds. I don't know what the heck <coughs> plus that is. That sounds like not like from America. Yeah, it's not one of those freedom <laughs> units. <laughs> um, if you prefer undercut or middle horizontal for, I guess, like a mid-ish weight class bot. It depends. Um, undercutters, I like undercutters, but they rely so heavily on the floor. Um, I think for that class, I think that is where you just start to get really cool mid-cutters. Um, you know, I have a mid-cutter. I have, you know, Psychotic Break in the three-pound class, and it's cool. I like it, but you're never really getting those devastating blows out of it because just the geometry and the strength to weight ratios and all that stuff. But once you start getting into that like 15 pound and up class, those mid cutters can get really nasty like beam and kitty cat and all of those. Um, so yeah, I kind of like mid cutters for that. The one bummer that I have about crippling depression is crippling depression never really scored a knockout hit. You know, I mean, it's been in four or five competitions and I never really knocked someone out. It's just kind of a bot that slowly wears someone down and creates a lot of damage over time. Um, whereas a mid cutter, you can just kind of knock someone out. So yeah, depends on what you're going after. Um, uh, I got two more. Okay, do you wanna dive into those? Yeah, I got two more on the list. So let's go with an anonymous question, which is do you lock tight the set screws on your wheel hubs? for insect to weight class robots. I've been having trouble keeping the wheel hubs from coming loose. Yes, um, if you watch, it's in one of my videos. Just watch all my videos back to back one day and you'll find it. Um, I lock tight the um, screw, set screws. It's pretty simple. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the video I did this in, but anyway, um, the thing that I do with the wheels, I just use finger tech snap hubs, whatever is um, I put them in there, I basically coat the set screw with Loctite, put the set screw in, tighten it. You can use one of these guys. That's gonna get it only so far. Um, go with one of your angle ones, you know, go with a traditional one of these and really get it down. Like get a good set of these so that you don't strip out the set screw but really get some leverage on that and tighten it as much as you possibly can by hand, you won't have an issue. Um, what I do for psychotic break is I actually completely coat the um, set screw and Loctite, put it in there, really tighten it down, and I actually super glue the wheels on. And if I ever need to change out a wheel, I'll literally just cut the wheel off, set the hub aside, add a new hub on there, super glue the wheel back on there, and I have like three sets of hubs or something. And when I get home, um, acetone will take the hub, it'll take the foam off and it'll dissolve the um, super glue. So I basically just soak them in acetone, clean them up and then reuse them. Um, it's not the best process or procedure, I'll admit, but you should not have issues with that set screw spinning if you lock tight it and really wrench down on it. So last question from the list, I think, yes. Jared, he went to Jared. I'm prototyping my first beetle weight and I'm debating between implementing a monolithic chassis body or making individual components and bolting them together. The strength rigidity of going mono is appealing, but the ease of repair is a concern. Um, what is your preference and why? Specifically in the beetle using, okay. So Jared. I would say my preference would be, you're talking about 3D printing out of Nylon X, print four of them, easy, simple. Um, you can do more clever geometry by doing a 3D printed mono chassis than you can doing bolted together. Don't worry about servicing. Um, if you've watched um, any of my videos really on any of my insect class bots, I basically make it so that nothing is bolted into the chassis. So when you open it up, you can just basically take the guts, plop them right out. That makes servicing very easy. If you design a single mono chassis and 3D print and just have four copies and you go through one, you know, almost every fight, that's fine. Um, it's really not that hard. 
the other thing that you do is make sure that you know that so that you can swap out a frame in 15 minutes. Um, I did that with a psychotic break in my last fight. Um, Isaac caught me from the back and ripped it off. It takes maybe 10 minutes to swap out the whole frame. No big deal. Just design around that and you should be fine. I'm done with the list, Kim. Um, I think, going through it, yeah. So what you got? I guess I can go back in the chat now. Oh boy, look at that. That chat is just... There's a lot of stuff. Holy crap, that is going. Okay, so um, I want to give a shout out to Mr. Chris and Just Cause Robotics for providing awesome answers in the chat. Oh, Just Cause Robotics. That's um, Bloodsport Guys. Oh, hey, cool. Yeah, they're, they're offering some really good uh, input. Yeah, he too. just... I th correct me if I'm wrong, but he just um, started a YouTube channel and has been doing a lot of um, really good tutorial videos oh, and stuff sweet. like that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Mr. Chris asks, um, what your opinion is of uh, Smee's implementation of a weapon on a long, long man type? I, I honestly, what did Smee do for a weapon? I haven't seen, I haven't seen their actual weapon. Um, Didn't they have, is it like an undercutter kind of thing? Or, I don't know. I lost track. I'm, I'm looking this up right now. I honestly forgot what Smee is doing um, in terms of a weapon. Let me, let me watch some YouTube videos. I'll admit, I'm not... Smee's cool. I'm not that into Smee. It's fine. <laughs> I, got, I got nothing else for you. Um, it, it's fine. Um, I guess I haven't seen enough about it to see the cleverness, you know? I mean, it's it's just a long wedge, and that's cool. Oh, it's two tiny horizontal spinners. Okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. No. <laughs> cool. All right. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, Pruth of asks if you've tried Fusion 360. I think you've answered that before. Yeah, I've used Fusion 360. It's fine. Um, the biggest issues that I have is it doesn't have a whole wizard, which boggles my mind. In SolidWorks, the whole wizard, you can basically just say, hey, put a hole here, make it a 1032 tap or countersink or whatever, and it's good to go. Um, many times I will go and like change all my fastener types and change them all. Not having the whole wizard really throws me off, and I also hate, 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 hate the mm. fact that it's cloud-based. I hate it. It's, oh. I, you, you have to store all your files online. Um, the other thing that I don't like is it doesn't import um, files cleanly, at least the old versions. You just can't import any file that you want. SolidWorks is a lot better. You also can't export. So everything is kind of saved on the cloud, and we got you, bro. I don't like it. Um, let's see, Fadox had a question about um, why verticals tend to work against drums, but uh, Bloodsport just cause kind of gave a really good answer that there's okay. reach and there's faster spin up time, you know, stuff like that. Um, Craftopia was asking about a shop tour. I didn't know if you're planning a video on that in the future. I've been, I've had a shop tour video on my to-do list for two years now. Um, I actually just kind of rearranged the shop, so I could give a very quick shop tour. Um, you, don't you dare try <laughs> I, I will not PJs. show Kim. I don't know about PJs. I know you're in your PJs. So let me see here. There we go. So let me start with over here. We're not going to show Kim, don't worry. <laughs> So this is the messy corner right now. Um, this has the Abbott CNC here, and yeah, that's all there is to this corner. Um, this is the far corner of the shop. This is actually exactly diagonal from the pegboard that I do all the um, intros at. And if we go over here, this is kind of unused space right now. Um, this is kind of table saw. You can see my new dust collector. Um, so I just got this uh, the other day. I gotta get the motor set up on it, um, but I've got the dust collector started to go. Don't worry, Kim, you're fine. Um, over here is drill press. I got the camera stand just kind of stashed right here. Um, I have bandsaw. This is where bandsaw is, and my little bin, hubby 
thing over there. Kim is still not visible. Not much to see. I'm redoing the shop, so all this kind of is just messy right now. Um, belt sander, arbor press. This all needs kind of a new home, um, so I got to figure something else out with that. Let's, oh, you're just going to keep doing that? Okay. <laughs> so this is laser. Uh, this is an upcoming video, so oh, oh I don't want to show this off yet. Um, this is an upcoming video that I have, uh, maybe next weekend, I built a new stand for the laser, so be on the lookout for that. And this is the, I pointed to the screen, I actually went up to the screen and pointed at the screen, I'm like, oh, look at that. Um, <laughs> this, this is outside and over there is into the house. So this actually goes inside the house, and so this is the... Um, pegboard that everyone is so familiar with. Yeah. This is a great shop tour. And then this kind of corner needs a little bit of work. Um, this is cabinet with um, all my paints and solvents and stuff like that in there. You can see all my lovely spray paints in there, mostly all black. Um, this corner is all my um, big part storage, small part storage, you can see all in these cabinets. So this is where all my screws and hardware go, other stuff. And then if we spin around, kind of almost full circle here. And then we got the Tormach and the lathe. Now what you guys are not seeing is right down here in the middle. So you're being swiveled on a monitor that sets in this huge bank of workbenches. So this is 16 feet by six feet of workbenches in the middle. It's kind of an island that sits in the middle of the shop and there's a monitor on an arm. So the webcam's on the monitor and this just kind of spins around so I can use the computer from any of the locations. So, Kim, you're going to duck down. <laughs> Let me do this. Whee! Okay. And I am back over here. Okay. Yeah, you're safe. So, that is kind of the shop tour. Um, I'm probably going to do a little bit more of a complete one, but... Let's see if I can give you an idea of that. So there's the workbenches. Watch out, Kim. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Yeah, so here's the workbench island. So I basically have one, two, three, four workbenches in the middle here. So this is about 16 feet by about six feet wide. Okay, you're good to go, Kim. <laughs> um, what else we got here? Offensive wedges. Um, Oliver was asking about your personal recommendation for an active weapon for a beetle. Active weapon for a beetle? Yeah. Whatever you want. I don't don't take any advice from me. Whatever you want to make, go for it. If you want to be a chump and just do a wedge, go for it. I, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Um, just build whatever you feel comfortable with. If there's a certain bot that you like, just do that. Did you see FS Phil's comment? I know. <laughs> he said there's a ghost. Said, I did. <laughs> he did. Um, let's see. Spectre asks uh, for a beetle weight flipper. Um, motor or compressed air? Well, not compressed air. Um... What am I thinking of? Who, what's the question? Let me find it. And yes, this is the um, ABC Yeah. Pinata. That was a long time ago now. This was the um, Featherweight Rumble Pinata. Is there still candy in this? Ew. 
<laughs> no, just... Yeah, CO, the little CO2 cartridges. Oh, for flippers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, compressed air is the way to go. Um, so I'm no expert in this. Um, you got to talk with D Smalls. The thing about, you can only, if we go back to my earlier comments about generating, storing, and transferring energy, if you have a flipper, that motor really doesn't get much chance to generate that stored energy. So like if you have a weapon that's spinning up and is spinning up, you're taking time to spin and store that energy. But if you have a flipper, you're really only storing a quarter of a second worth of energy. So compressed air is a much better way to go because you can get much higher energy transfer quicker. Yeah. Overwhelming in the chat. What happened to? I'm just gonna. I'm just skipping right ahead. Okay. Um, I've seen it out of the frame. Oh yeah. Um, what happened to the previous versions of crippling depression? Um, Pretty framed. Yeah. It's it's around. Um, this is. A framed, whoa. This is a framed piece of crippling depression. I just kind of made a little shadow box. I was going to do this with uh, most of my broken pieces. Um, it's just kind of around in, in the, uh, uh, yeah. In the bins that you saw back there. In these bins, I have a lot of various robot parts in there. Um, so, some of the frame pieces are in there, um, just scattered throughout. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and I've given some away. Uh, Pietro said, kind of a new question. Can you use scooter motors from 250 watt to 3000 watt in 250 pound bots? with the standard wattage of a 250 pound weapon and wheel motors. Where do you find that? It's up a bit. Oh. It's right above all the stop signs. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, can you use scooter motors? Scooter motors is kind of a generic thing. Um, once again, any motor that fits the specs that you need it to will work just fine. The motors aren't really anything special. Figure out what the motor needs to be, then find the motor that fits the specs. Um, I do have, I don't know if you can see it. Oh. This is a test platform, which is very heavy. This is a test platform for a 250 pound crippling depression. This thing with, um, these are just the hoverboard motors. This with the vests on each channel, with the big vests on every channel, absolutely screams. Um, I put uh, about 100, 150 pounds worth of weight on it, and it just slid right out from underneath of it and left, what, like six foot long tire marks on my driveway. The thing is, insanity. Um, if you power up those motors just fine, if you give them the right amount of power, they will just scream. So yeah, you can use scooter motors. Um, Have but, you heard, what? Uh, but you know what? Pietro, if you're asking noob questions, don't build a 250. Like straight up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't build a 250 pound robot if you're new to this. Just don't. Stop. You can get hurt. Dead, uh, totally serious. Do not build a 250 unless you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, Apex Leo asked if you've ever worked on a hammer bot, which I know you haven't, but... Um, hammer bot, nope. Never done a hammer bot. Um, yeah, just never done it. Um, Fadox was asking about uh, combat robotics considerations for getting a 3D printer, and mm -hmm. Mr. Chris had some good... Uh, comments on that, but you might want to talk about um, Nylon X and having like a hardened nozzle and stuff like that. I have a whole video on that. Why don't you plug that video? There's a video on my channel. <laughs> um, I think it's um, 
3D printing guide, nylon printing guide. Um, if you search my channel for Nylon X, you can find it, but I have a whole printing guide on um, Nylon X and specific materials for that. Um, talking about hardened nozzles, some temperature stuff, things like that. Um, but yeah, it's you don't really need anything crazy. You just basically need a hard nozzle and an all metal hot end, and then you're good to go. How do you come up with your bot names as per <laughs> Yeah, so how do I come up with the bot names? Um, we were talking about earlier how Kim and I would go for walks with the dogs and we would discuss combat robots. Um, that's pretty much how they come, you know, how we come up with them. We just kind of spitball back and forth and figure things out. Um, I have two bot naming conventions. We have the psychology based ones, which are my real bots. And then the kind of other ones are more just kind of experimental designs and those don't have psychology themed names. So yeah, just a lot of kind of planning and thinking things out. Do you know of any other three pound um, bot kits? I, all I know is finger tech with that beater bar set up. That's a one pound. What? I oh, the, oh the... Yeah, the Viper, and there's like a beater bar assembly. I thought that was a three pound. The, it's a three pound beater bar, but I don't think they have a full kit for it. Oh, okay. um, the The three pounder that we will not speak of is the... Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, that. The, the wedge. Yeah. Boo! <laughs> well, no. Super Looks like it's slowed down. That's. Oh, I really can dig in the. Oh my god, that's so many questions. I know. Oh, these are exhausting. <laughs> trying to think of anything else to show off or talk about. Yeah, I know we missed some along, but it's hard to separate what the questions were and what comments were. Well, that's why we, yeah, yeah, D2s, boo. They just win, and yeah. Unused car designs. Hmm. Like, Maybe cat designs? Maybe it means oh, cat designs. I don't know. Yeah, my, my CAD designs are not, most of them, like I have files and it's literally yeah, just, yeah. it's just a rectangle with a couple features in it and I abandoned it. They're not very interesting, <laughs> like all the idea was just in my head. <laughs> oh, Motorama. I don't know, will you ever do Motorama again? Eh, I probably won't do Motorama again until they fix their floor, like... Uh, screw it. They need to update their arena. You know, the arena, putting a tip speed limit wasn't the right call. You should just update the arena and fix it. The floor is bad. The walls are safe, but maybe not super safe. I don't know. I, I, if they updated the arena, I would 100% come back. If they don't update the arena, probably not. Um, I don't like the wood floor. Um, I don't like... The fact that the wood floor is so bad. Mm -hmm. Well, and didn't they change the tip speed limit like at the event? They changed it the week before. Yeah, oh, we had already yeah, like very short notice. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I didn't like that. So yeah, probably not returning to uh, Motorama. When do you plan to make Copperhead wheels? Um, I thought you already did a video on the wheels. No, I didn't. Oh, um, okay. So I'll show something off here. The, the bucket of goo? Yeah, bucket of goo. Oh, and the mold is cool. Show the yeah, mold. Yeah, the mold. So here is... <laughs> this is what's left over from um, pouring one of the wheels. Um, the wheel that you saw right here was actually new. You can see it's still got um, the little stuff on it. I, I should make this video. There's just no real... Um, pressing issue because I'm, I have this stuff, but let me show you the mold. Oh my God. Oh. Big boy. Jesus, this is heavy. <laughs> this is really heavy. This is a solid chunk of aluminum. Okay. You guys better like this. <laughs> 
So here is one of the wheels for Copperhead. Hi. There we go. <laughs> so here is the mold for one of the wheels. You can see we haven't unmolded it yet, um, but here is where we pour in. There's two um, little gates right here. And if you look closely at the wheels, you can see right here and here, or where we just kind of cut them off. And so yeah, we basically take this nylon hub, it gets put into the bottom of this mold, and you can see there's a seam right there, seam right there, so, so this is four pieces, one, two, and then three, four, and there's um, some keyed features here on the top and bottom, and basically we put the um, hub on the inside of this, pour it up a little bit, then put on these, clamp it all down, and then fill it until it comes up to this edge. And then we break apart this mold and you're left with a wheel. Um, I am planning on doing a full video on this and I'm gonna start trying to mold some of my own wheels, but just haven't really gotten around to it yet. That? I think maybe that's about it. I think we should call it. Yeah? Yeah, unless anyone has any other pressing concerns. Oh, Zoomania has asked us a couple times. I want to get this. Um, using 6061 T6 for a chassis of a 90 pound bot, which is an awkward size. Um, they're worried about it being strong enough. For a 60 pound? For a 90 pound bot. Oh, 90? Um, I, I, you're fine. Um, Bite Force is made out of 6061. I mean, Bite Force is just water jet cut aluminum. Um, it really comes down to geometry, how thick and how you're attaching and everything. But yeah, aluminum is totally fine, even up to a heavyweight. Um, Duck is 6061. Duck seems to do okay. Um, there's there's a few bots that are 6061. It's totally fine. It's just don't don't expect to be using like you know, quarter or half inch, you might have to go like one inch thick or something, but yeah, totally fine. Um, there's a lot of questions about um, events being good or not, like Seattle <laughs> bot battles. I mean, we honestly kind of don't know. We only do the kind of mid, let's see, we do Motorama, Arizona, which ABC. is awesome. ABC. Um, we did the California one when it still existed. Yeah, events are always different. Um, every event is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, wait, whoa, hey, Mr. Chris says aluminum mold seems excessive. Um, no, um, it's not. It's not excessive. Uh, the, no, you really need something pretty uh, sturdy. A 3D printed wouldn't work. Um, plastic shift too much, um, sticks to it. I don't know what you would use other than aluminum, honestly. Yeah, but it was quite spendy. Well, it was spendy because we did it last minute. Oh, okay. We actually got that made through Proto Labs because um, it got pushed back. Uh, the deadline, we missed a deadline and it was done at the last minute. Uh, what was my first competition? First competition was Sergeant Cuddle's Robo Games. Robo Games. 20... Fifteen? Something like that. I don't know. Um, my first competition, yeah, was Robo Games many, many years ago, and I lost two fights in a row. I spent what? It, that was Sergeant Cuddles, and it was the original videos that everyone saw of Sergeant Cuddles. I went and fought, lost my first two matches. That was it. It was like what two hours into Robo Games, and we were done. And it was like. Well, that was stupid. <laughs> and I actually stopped doing combat robots for like six months until ABC started doing combat robots and actually literally just dusted off cuddles, made a couple tweaks. And um, that's when I really got into it is when I actually, um, I, I won that time. Um, but yeah, I, I put away combat robots for a while. Yeah, I think we're 
wrapping up here. Yeah. I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to answer the last one from Banjo Gates. What are your sizing suggestions? Make it the right size, but not too small, not too big. I mean, <laughs> you got to figure out what you want, man. If you're going to do a drum, what's the rest of the bot look like? Don't design around the weapon, design around the concept. So how big do you need the drum to be? You know, figure out what the bot's going to be. Is it going to be four wheel drive? Is it going to be two wheel drive? You know, figure out what you want the concept of it to be. And most of these things are going to fall in place. You're going to have 500 variables that you're going to have to figure out when designing a robot. Start with one of them, knock it off the list, then do the next one, check that off. And you'll find that the more variables you figure out, the other variables will start becoming um, fixed. You know, you're being like, well, this has to be this size. Well, I only have one pound for this. You know, everything else is going to kind of figure itself out. All right. That's all I got. Um, thank you, everyone. I'll be doing another one of these, eh, you know, probably another month, something like that. But I've got a lot of videos to post and get through. So thank you for watching. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys in the next stream. Adios. Okie dokie. Bye.